Okay, so let's begin. Uh, welcome everybody to this uh, event. Uh, we have about 60 world participants in our list right now. So that's quite a good number, Dr. Chan. And uh, this evening, uh, this afternoon, rather not yet evening, we are having the webinar on vermiculture composting by Dr. Chan Ukraine. And um, uh, I'm just um, introducing myself as Kuokan from the EcoHub community. And I would like to remind everybody that we should uh, mute our microphones while uh, the presenter is speaking. And later, the question and answer, you can unmute to speak or raise your question. So I'll pass it over to Ramesh now. Uh, Ramesh is the co-organizer of this event uh, as one of the directors of the STEM for All Makerspace. Please, Ramesh, go ahead. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, but I think one of our um, followers is trying to share a screen. Ah, okay, now we got it right. She's removed. Okay, great. <clears throat> uh, I'm Ramesh, uh, and I'm one of the persons who is running the STEM for All Makerspace together with my other partner, William and <laughs> Dr. Ramashazi and Nishima Noor, and managed by Ms. Narenda. Now, we are doing this webinar series because we can't do anything physical. Therefore, we thought that it is best to keep all our audience engaged and excited with what we plan to do uh, post lockdown. All right. So this session today is very much to get to know people um, who are very keen to know about certain topics. Now, in the past, STEM for Hall Makerspace, we have done a few eco-related programs, you know. So, and I must tell you, it has been a very exciting journey. All right. We had talks by Dr. Ting on healthy soil. Uh, a talk by Dr. Mazalina on bamboo. Uh, we had a talk by Dr. Kogila on Love the Nature. And I must say that all these sessions were very well participated and we had very good questions. So today we are very fortunate to have Dr. Chan, uh, Dr. Chan here with us to share about wormy composting. Now, a very quick introduction to Dr. Chan. She's a teacher, she's an environmentalist, and most importantly, she's a passionate person, a passionate gardener, right? So she's here. She'll introduce herself more as we go along in all the presentations. She is a visionary, I must say, right? Uh, she has done a lot of research. And in her presentation, she'll be sharing some of the outlooks that she has uh, researched, you know, especially in going green, the green revolution. Uh, many people have talked about it. Mm -hmm. But I think here, somebody who is putting to action uh, what people have been saying, and we are very, very fortunate. We meaning STEM for All Makerspace, together with our Eco Hub community. And this is where Mr. Ku comes in. Now, he is another person who is very passionate and has lots of experience in gardening and farming and environmental issue. So we got together and say, let's form a subcommittee. Now we have a subcommittee that we call ourselves STEM Eco Hub Community. Now, our hope is that uh, all of you have joined the session today, and I see many new faces, and these are mainly friends of Dr. Chan. We welcome you. And if you like to follow us through our group, our chat group, uh, we'd like to know more about you, and maybe you can also share some of the things that you. Um, that is the initiative that we have taken during this difficult times of this pandemic, all right? So we are doing everything virtually, but we are very hopeful that when things get back to normal, we'll be able to meet you physically at our Stand for All Makerspace in Daman, all right? So with that introduction, I would like to pass this space uh, to Dr. Chan to please present your case. Thank you, Mr. Ramesh, for the very kind introduction. I would like to thank EcoHub for giving me this platform to share some of my thoughts. And I will try to get into um, my slides at this moment. This is something that is a bit of a... I mean, there is some deficiency here for me because my computer always seems to fail me <laughs> at the correct moment. All right, it says you are sharing screen. So I'm going to try to share to get at my slides. All right, let me see. No, it won't allow me to share my slides. Okay, let's see if I can get any better. Um, can you all see my slides? Yes, no? 
No slides no. yet. No, 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 slides. no slides. All right, not to panic. Let's see whether, all right, it can get there. Uh huh. Would this be good enough? Yeah, I think this is happening. Yes. It is coming through. All right. Okay. So for the next half an hour, to all the participants who are growers, gardeners, as well as probably some non-gardeners whom I hope to influence, we are in the next half an hour going to bring you away from the gloom and doom of the pandemic and the economic meltdown that is swirling in our mess, especially when you get 24 hours of barrage of news from everywhere, the mass media included. I'm going to uh, allow you to relax momentarily in my garden. And uh, from what you can see even here on this first slide, you will probably guess that this garden is actually quite big. Yeah, it is big. It is, uh, I'm very fortunate this garden is about 90 by 20 feet. Oh. Um, those of you who have a smaller garden, don't be disheartened. This is my sister's garden. She lives in a three bedroom condominium with a, a veranda, which serves her green needs as well. And you can see she's actually faithfully growing ladies fingers here. And this was actually given to her obviously by me, by mistake. And she managed to allow or, or grow this honeydew to this stage. But she <laughs> didn't, in the end, she didn't um, get it to fruition because she had to travel before the Chinese New Year, um, many, many years before the pandemic, and it didn't reach her table, of course. Obviously, if you have special fruit trees in mind, you have to have a big garden. In mine, I have about 15 fruit trees in various stages of um, growth as well as fruit production. You can recognize the nanka, um, the papaya, custard apple, and as well as pomegranate. Um, I think there's some interference from, um, yeah, from uh, mics that are not muted. All right, I also happen to stay in a corner lot and a gated community as well. So I do make use of the space around my home. And here you can see a chiku tree uh, with fruits that, that are respected as a kind of mine because of the amount of hard work I put in to grow them. Um, again, you can possibly consider a vertical garden as well. I do have a vertical garden where I stack the pots and this is actually created by my husband, the frame. And I do have uh, um, uh, pots in the frame itself. So I do grow vertically upwards when space is needed. And I grow most of my plants in pots as well, big ones, small ones, and even hanging ones as you can see here. Is it possible to grow uh, fruit trees in a pot? Well, I have tried and let me share some of my experience. This is actually a passion fruit tree creeper. And as you can see, um, there were fruits in this pot. In fact, however, because the fruits are grown in a pot, I could only see, have uh, four fruits in this particular plant. And uh, for a period of time, when I was actually uh, offered mulberry trees to grow, I kind of refused it because I was thinking that my garden would not be able to accommodate any more plants. And uh, subsequently, when I realized I could grow it in a pot and allow it to fruit, I'm happily harvesting many crops of it as well now. And this is a fig tree that was recently given to me by one of my neighbors. And I made, of course, I did my homework and I realized that fig trees prefer to have their roots confined and they will bear fruits if their roots are confined. So they will happily grow and produce fruits in the pot itself. So I'm looking forward to this as well. Of course, I um, kind of uh, have uh, nourishing soil or, or, or enriched soil for them. So I'm looking um, to, towards to see what the future will be like for that tree. Well, with the pandemic promising to go on forever and ever, 
a big house is probably not the answer if we are going to be hosting our friends and visitors. And a big garden is what we may actually be looking for. Now, if you think that this is part of the pandemic, this is pre-pandemic, it happens to be the Chinese New Year before the pandemic started. And obviously, a, a big garden like this uh, will allow you to host your friends. Of course, with the pandemic, we have to uh, have masks and social distancing in the bargain as well. And I do have visitors, as you can see, but the difference is they also get door gifts from me uh, before they leave. And of course, I, I present them with whatever is in season. And this is pre-pandemic. And uh, these two ladies, pretty ladies, were actually given bitter gods, as you can see here. And uh, these two friends, during the pandemic, I actually passed the, gave them passion fruit. And whatever is grown in your garden can very neatly be made into a fruit basket and it will be appreciated very well as well because it's homegrown and sometimes it's better than the fruit basket you get from the fruiterers itself. Besides human visitors, I also get other beautiful visitors from nature and it is really an eye-opening experience to say the least. Here I have for the first time seen this butterfly uh, settle on the workbench in my garden and I learned from my friends when I shared the picture that it is the very famous Raja Brook that Malaysia is actually famous for, the Raja Brook butterfly. Since then, I have now opened my eyes to this set of butterflies and this very morning itself, I saw another one fluttering around. Of course, I am now more aware of the bees that we are supposed to preserve and how busy they can be. And uh, why do I say how busy? I've noticed how busy they are. Um, this is actually the flower of the passion fruit. And you will notice that um, it is actually a very fragrant, I, I mean, it's a white flower. And all white flowers tend to be fragrant because this is their only way of attracting uh, bees. Um, strangely enough, this flower will only open after about 2 p.m. in the afternoon. When they, have arrived, uh, when they have derived enough energy from the sun. Now, the issue is, there was a period of time when I attracted all these bees into my garden with this bunga pelulut or the bunga pengantin. And these bees, at the same time, were hovering around my passion fruit flower. And in less than one hour after their opening at 2 o'clock, all the pollen are depleted. So bees, besides collecting honey, they actually collect your pollen for bread, so to speak. So in the end, I realized they were not only um, doing quite a lot of, uh, shall we say, damage to my flowers by not pollinating them properly and not allowing me to get at the fruits. I had to um, figure out which were the flowers that were likely to open for the day, cover them up faithfully and do my own pollination. So that's why they say busy as the bee. Yeah, they really get very busy and they remove everything that you have. So this is how, um, if I do the pollination well, this is my reward for pollinating the plant. That's the passion fruit. Um, of course, when the garden is productive, you get to eat all your food or fruits of your, uh, of your hard work very fresh. In fact, there are many a times where I will go to the garden and be inspired by what is available and then decide, okay, I'll whip up something, maybe with the uh, bitter gourd or maybe with uh, the cucumbers that I have here. So it depends on what inspires me for the day to make the meal for the day. Now, obviously, with um, so much being produced, I do have lots of excess and these go to my neighbors who have also very kindly increased further the variety of food that I enjoy. Obviously, there's no more room in my garden to accommodate the growth of coconuts or star fruits, but some of my neighbors have them. And when these are given to them, they return in kind. And I even have, I call her the best cook in Bukit Rimau. And this is sambal blachan, not sambal blachan, petai sambal blachan. And obviously, 
this is uh, something that my husband loves and it is um, something that increases the variety of food that we get to savor. In these harsh economic times where the ringgit is actually shrinking by the minute, it is, and, and, and the weather actually, or the climate is changing like mad as well, it is obviously very good to have a microsomal patch to yourself uh, to tide over, uh, you know, when, when, when the uh, going gets tough, as well as a place for you to keep happy. And uh, as I said, yeah, this is a dish, the honey, uh, sorry, the bitter gourd, uh, laced with honey raw. So it can just easily form a dish for a meal. Similarly, this is the mulberry, uh, mulberries that I was talking about after a number of collections together with the lemon all whipped into a jam and then subsequently put into a pie for another meal or so. On top of that, the produce is pesticide free because I don't use pesticide. Uh, but it does mean a lot of hard work to keep the produce going. And we have to, or I spend a bit of time manually removing infested leaves. Plus, occasionally, I have to almost turn the plant upside down to make sure the pests are totally removed. And to assist me in this hard work and to make the produce uh, plentiful, of course, I have all these worms to help me. And um, I actually house all these worms in uh, pots, reasonably big ones. Some of them are about one feet across and others are almost about two feet. So they, I do have big ones as well. And there are about nine to 12 pots. I tend to call my worms, between my husband and me, we refer to them as underground migrant workers. And why migrant? Because they either migrate from one pot to another, and of course, all sanctioned by me, and the migration is legal. At times, they will migrate to my neighbor's pots as well, or probably even further afield to my other gardening friends in and around um, um, the Clang Valley. So maybe I'll show you how I start a new pot of composting. This is actually, a, uh, you can see a used pot. But the first thing I have to ensure when I do that is to make sure the holes in the pots are patent. This is extremely important because you don't want the worms to be drowning um, in, in the compost later. And this will lead to fermentation, which will actually add the sting that some of this uh, fermentation brings about. So we need to make sure the holes are patent for good drainage. And I will put a layer of soil and that first layer usually comes from this brown soil, which is uh, more granular than the black soil. These are not rich soil. These are soil, um, which in the Malaysian context is about two ringgit or probably it's about 230 now. A ringgit per bag. And this is what I use, as I said, for the base so that it allows for good drainage. So we start that and then we put the whatever we need to compost on top of that layer. And after that, I will put my soil with earthworms, as you can see here, right over uh, to cover the uh, composting material or the organic material that I want. Before it's like a customer defect. So so they are saying that in future they will see this. Oh, oh dear, there's a bit of interference. Can we ask the person to mute his phone, please? But only All right. the investment on the program are huh. need to check. Who, who is it? That is Can we ask way? the person to mute his phone? All right. Okay. Anyway, after that, we actually put the soil, the uh, the soil with the earthworms over it, and the next mm -hmm. day we will do exactly the same. So it goes layer by layer, each time with soil containing earthworms. While, while I seem to labor under the Maybe idea... The D4R and the, uh, the D4R cost is again how by the part itself. And 
mute. All right. Am I okay now? All right. Hopefully you can still hear me. Now, so we go layer by layer. And as I say, while I give the impression the earthworms are doing the job, there are lots and lots of microbes that help with the process as well. And, uh, what, and, and each time after I put the uh, organic material and the cover of uh, soil, I cover it with a lid that allows ventilation to occur. As you can see here, this is an improvised uh, lid that allows ventilation to occur. All right, now besides the soil I pointed out to you, uh, we also use soil that has been depleted. How do I recognize this soil? If you look at a plant, if there are roots coming to the surface, it shows that these roots are no longer able to get nutrients down there and this soil needs to be recycled and enriched. So um, in the process, over the many years, I have begun to understand what I would call plant language. It's as if you are talking to the plant or the plants are actually talking to you and you have to appreciate the language they use. Similarly here, this is actually a plant that is very healthy. It's telling you I'm very good. It's producing fruits for you. But on the other hand, this plant is trying to tell you I'm dying. The body language of a plant that's gone into senescence. So what do I feed my worms with? Um, I like collecting leaves and flowers from the garden. Now, plants put in a lot of energy to make flowers to attract the bees, all right? And the more colorful ones, the more energy they have to use. So all these are collected at convenient pot areas and they go into the composting bin. And whatever, from the, whatever organic waste from the kitchen actually also goes in, bread crumbs, and at one stage, I advised that citrus fruit should not go in because it's acidic. But I realized with the number of worms that I have, they happily tolerate the acidity uh, that everybody describes. In fact, if you put this in, the soil smells very orangey and fragrant as well. Um, even the covering of um, the salted egg goes right in. And in the last two years, after our durian meals, even the durian skin goes right into the compost. And these are the exhumed products after two weeks of composting uh, of the durian skin. What else do I put in? This is actually a mango seed. Again, previously, I would avoid because um, all these seeds tend to germinate um, in this enriched soil. But now I happily put them in as well. And why so? Because... I can always fish it out, remove the uh, growing plant, and then put the cotyledon and whatever, because they are very nutritious, they have high protein contents, and they go back into the soil. Similarly here, this is actually a durian seed uh, with me having destroyed the, part, uh, the, 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 the growing part and the cotyledon having gone back into the soil. So water for our worms. It's very important to recognize that the pot needs to be watered as much as you would want to water a plant. So my husband has very cleverly um, got a rainwater harvesting system into play. And this picture was very cleverly taken by him just a few days ago when it rained in the morning. And he managed to... Uh, capture, he's quite a good photographer as well, he managed to capture this, uh, this picture uh, with his system in action. So water from the kitchen itself also is faithfully collected. Uh, of course, I don't um, collect water that has soap inside, but water that has been used to wash vegetables or the likes. You'll probably be asking me whether I feed my milk, um, whether I feed milk to my earthworms, no, this is actually an empty milk container. And into this container, I flush water that has come from the kitchen. And then because this container of empty container of milk has microbes inside, I happily pour them right into the compost bin or into plants itself. So how much do they eat per day? I vaguely remember a long time ago when I was doing vermicomposting lectures for the Lions Club. Um, they eat one kilogram of food um, 
or rather one kilogram of worms eat one kilogram of food. So I decided I must make sure that I have uh, written evidence somewhere to convince all of you. So I managed to find these two articles by one by Amy Grant, which says one pound of worms. Now one pound would be about half a kilo. And apparently half a kilo contain 1,000 worms. So in my pot, I actually can estimate that there are about one quarter uh, pounds of worms. That means I probably have about 500 worms in every pot that is already uh, fully mature. So one pound of worms eat about one pound of food scraps. And for those of you who believe you can only rely uh, on the referee journal, this is similarly mentioned in this particular journal about their intake. So they do eat quite rapidly, these worms. Now, what do I avoid feeding my worms with? Here, this is um, an infested nangka, so it doesn't go into the composted bin. And here is the uh, uh, diseased, uh, the, the rust disease of, uh, of um, grapes and they don't go into the bin either. Now, you notice this is actually dried papaya leaves. I have three papayas and because there's a serious epidemic in the Malaysian uh, environment of papayas, what we call the papaya dieback disease, I also do not put papaya leaves into the compost just in case one gets infected, the whole three papayas would get infected with the uh, um, compost that I supply if they become infected. Obviously, I have to uh, protect these pots from vermin. And I did tell you about using uh, covers that will allow for ventilation. So these are drain covers. And in order to afford um, further prevent, uh, uh, further protection against very intelligent vermin, I put weights like bricks or I, I will even improvise a pot and put uh, composted soil on top. How do I harvest for the soil? Uh, because the uh, contents of what I put in um, decompose at different rates, whatever is not decomposed properly, I kind of put it aside and I just harvest whatever soil uh, that I feel has already been matured by this composting process and they are spread out either to, to get a new pot of plant uh, growing or to be distributed to other plants as well as trees. Now, whatever comes out from all these worms in the form of um, cast just gets integrated into the soil in the pot itself. But because I water the, plant, uh, water the pots, a lot of it is actually collected as uh, what I would call worm tea from the pots at the bottom end. So these are collected faithfully. And uh, in fact, every day, because I don't want mosquitoes to breed in it, and then poured onto the next plant or any plant that is in need of nourishment. Obviously, um, I do have pots near uh, my banana plot as well. And this is a pot near my second um, custard apple fruit tree. This drain directly into the fruit trees and I don't bother to collect the uh, worm tea. Okay, I'm going to sing for you. I want to teach the world to plant in perfect harmony. Well, I'm not going to carry on from here because my son thinks I don't have enough even within one octave range to sing the whole song for you. But I would like to build the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees. Obviously, I can't grow apple trees, so a custard apple would do. And attract honeybees. And even attract doves into the garden. This is a picture taken of a dove that flew into my garden, although not of the snow white turtle doves type. So while you can see that um, I can't sing, I must admit I have a passion for teaching. I have been teaching for the last 35 years or so. I've just retired from a teaching job, teaching doctors and specialists. And uh, while I have retired, I'm still employed on a part-time basis as well as 
in uh, many of the programs nationally for my trainees. And I am also an international teacher as well. So um, while I do have time and a passion for teaching, I have decided that I must extend my passion there too into greener pastures, both literally as well as figuratively. So I believe very much in this maxim, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. So my philosophy is we have to teach a man to plant so that he can have food for a lifetime. Well, 155 million people around the world go to bed hungry every day. And from Oxfam, we know that 11 people die of hunger every minute. And do you know this translates to 6 million people dying of hunger every year. So if you think that 6 million is a small number, think of the 4 million people who have died over the last 18 months in the pandemic. And we call that the COVID-19 pandemic. So the hunger pandemic is actually already here without a lot of us being aware of it. It has overtaken in numbers the COVID pandemic death. So 6 million versus 4 million. So what this man is doing here is he's helping with supplying, of course, the hungry people with food. But it's only going to last a few meals. It's not going to last a lifetime for these people who are crying out for food. The alarm bell was actually sounded about five months into the pandemic. And as you can see here, this is actually by a very reputable journey, uh, a journal. And we know that it is going to come. It's going to hit us real hard. Already, many, many countries are hoarding food, knowing that the uh, pandemic will make us um, have supply chain disruptions in every country. And you're probably able to see it already, but you did not connect the two. Note the high prices of many of the food that we eat, and it's going upwards all the time, not only in our country, but in many other countries. Look at Lebanon. Look at all these other countries. In fact, yesterday, it was in the news as well. I can't remember which country it was, but they were crying. I think it was Bangladesh. They were crying over the high prices that they could no longer afford. So I totally agree with what Dr. Norman Volek has to say. He, by the way, is the father of the Green Revolution in the 1960s. He says, you can't build a peaceful world on empty stomachs and human misery. Well, if you think that we are not too bad, look, we are actually in the green zone. Good performance, you will say. Malaysia, almost equal to the developed world in terms of food security. But this is the detail of that particular survey. And out of 113 countries, we are actually 43rd in a row. So I'm going to urge each and every one of you listening in to become a teacher like me. Teach a man to plant and he can have food for a lifetime, not just distribute food for him for the next few meals and be done with that. You have to teach him to plant his own food. Let us embrace the Green Revolution 2.0. And the focus of that Green Revolution is to plant in a sustainable manner. I've shown you how to make your soil healthy. I have shown you how to grow organic food. And the focus is sustainable energy path. So the magic word is sustain. To the anesthesiologists in the group, Yes, we have also embraced the green revolution in our own small way. We have told our community of anesthesiologists as well as our trainees 
to either use low flow of the nitrous oxide. Incidentally, nitrous oxide is the laughing gas that all of us, um, the non-anesthesiologists would know of. And this is one of the gases which contribute to the greenhouse uh, gas effect, just like carbon dioxide, all right, that causes global warming. Well, if you think that by doing what you are doing, uh, fellow anesthesiologists, we are only contributing less than 4% of the uh, uh, impact that we hope to do or create to bring the, the, the nitrous oxide uh, part of the greenhouse gas effect down. The main culprit is actually the industrial players and it is actually the... Um, uh, the, the, the soil management, agriculture soil management, the fertilizer production that is the main culprit. And what are the countries that are responsible? India, US, and China. No doubt these are 2,000 figures, but it remains the same. And have you now any reason to figure out why we are seeing the wildfires in the western part of the US, or for that matter, the flooding that is happening in Europe, India, as well as China. All these are made by the very people who are producing those gas emissions without realizing they are not planting in a sustainable manner and they're contributing to their own misery. So to those younger people in the crowd, your tomorrows are not guaranteed. So live every day with gratitude. Spend time taking care of yourself. Absorb the beauty of the earth. Uh, absorb the beauty the earth has to offer. And live every single day to the fullest. This has come from Roger Lee. And all of us at the end of our lifetime would like to have lived a full life. And that involves planting a tree. I've done that. Planted many trees as I've shown. Have a child. I have two boys. Write a book. I've done many of these books myself as well. I would like to record a vote of thanks to all those who have given me their special permission to use the photos in this presentation. And uh, I must say their photos have helped me put this story in perspective. Of course, I would like to thank my dear husband, very creative man he is, who shares my passion and uh, he is actually my co-CEO. CEO, not in terms of um, the usual CEO, but CEO as Chief Earthworm Officer, looking after the earthworms so that I get adequate, nice, uh, enriched soil so that my curry leaves, um, which is actually community famous because all my neighbours who want um, fragrant curry leaves come for it here. I do have a lot of fun learning with my gardening groups to which I belong. And uh, here, I again, this is a creation of my husband. What he has done is he's made this flower with rock melon peels as well as orange peel. And uh, I decided to send it to one of my gardening group. And uh, there is one person, uh, one lady there who always um, encourages us to learn about this, uh, the variety of plants that we have. So we keep on learning and we learn from this app called Seek. So I sent it to her without revealing what this flower on the table was all about. And uh, true enough, she came back and said, look YK, Seek believe your yellow flower is a bromeliad. So when I told her this is not a flower, but a make flower, Makeup flower by my husband. We all had a good laugh, knowing that we can even fool sick in the process as well. While we learn about the different flowers we have in our gardens, I have also learned a lot from joining Eco Hub community, um, especially when I was introduced into it. And uh, I must thank them as well for extending me in so many ways and inviting me as well, and giving me the platform to share something I'm very passionate about. As you can see, what I have done is done with very limited resources. It is very enriching in terms of uh, the soil, and it can be done very rapidly. And I don't allow 
my waste to go into the dustbin itself to fill the many, many tons that you have that fills the landfill, they all go into the kitchen. Uh, sorry, they all go into my compost bin. And many a times, there is no collection from my house for the dustbin itself. Um, I would like to thank everybody for listening in and then I would like to thank EcoHub. And for those of you who now realizes how um, we can actually unite under one uh, hub, you may want to take this down as well and be part of um, an enlarging community of um, ecologically friendly uh, a group of people and be part of a team that is going to reach out to others to transform the world for ourselves. Um, I'm going to pass it back to you, Mr. Ramesh and Mr. Ku, whom I would like to thank as well, especially Mr. Ku and Mr. Ramesh for getting me into this group as well as uh, for allowing me this platform to share my interests. Thank you. I'm going to um, uh, stop sharing the screen and we get back to the main group. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chan. Uh, your passion shines through, I must say, and your presentation has been very meticulously prepared. I must say it was so very uh, uh, engaging and enlightening. We have got 99 people who are following your session today, and it's quite a big record for us as well. There's lots of new faces, and I think uh, many of them come on, on board because they want to hear you and because you. you have also invited them. So uh, let me quickly recap what I have gained from this session before we pass the, uh, the I always say, floor. You know, there's no more floor these days. It's this, this, this virtual space that we are in. And Mr. Ku can also help to moderate some of the questions. Yeah. So firstly, I would like to thank you again. And also your CEO. Uh, lovely title you've given him, you know. Uh, but I must say he is a very creative person. Okay? I, I really love the way he has made his normal rainwater harvester into something that looks so very uh, like a fountain, like a waterfall, a cascading uh, a, a pond. Uh, excellent. It looks so And I'm sure it has got a function, not just besides the aesthetic part of it. Yeah? So uh, congrats to him. It's a wonderful team. It's so very inspiring because I think youngsters can learn so much from both of you working as a team. That's one of the take back. But I want to really say before I pass it to others to you know to give them a chance to uh, give you their thoughts and as well uh, their questions. I would like to say that what you're doing, uh, Dr. Chan and your entire community is that you're, you're actually pr practicing this buzzword now, which is called circular economy, All right? You circular economy within you know, your home and within your neighborhood, you know, you plant, you attract bees, you attract birds, you attract butterflies, uh, and it is so harmonious, you know, and the excess that you have, you share with your neighbors. What more, you know, is, uh, uh, you know, it's such a wonderful thing. That's, I believe, is what circular economy is. So you keep the cost down and everybody benefits. So all it takes is just a few persons like you, and I think the entire community will benefit. Uh, that's the take back that I see. But let me pass this um, space to Mr. Ku also. Maybe you would like to say something and then we can take the questions from our audience, right? So audience, if you would like to ask the questions directly, you can turn your mic on and uh, then the, you can ask direct the questions to Dr. Chan. Mr. Ku, you want to say something first? Oh, just that uh, that was a very clear, concise presentation by Dr. Chan. And um, I think it was a very good uh, guidance for people who want to try the gardening at home. And it doesn't really matter what size of garden you have. You can always start. Uh, we have members who have um, balconies in apartments and they like to have their gardens there as well. We, we can actually um, ask Dr. Chan some questions from the chat group while others are perhaps waiting to, to ask themselves. Uh, Dr. Zulkifli Ismail did ask, what uh, appropriate soil to use. Can you just buy any soil, Dr. Chan? Yeah, you can get any soil, but don't buy clay because clay would not allow a uh, drainage of water to go through. So remember the black soil and the uh, uh, orange uh, 
brown soil that um, I have shared, those soil would be useful. Those soil are not enriched. They're only about two ringgit per pack. And you can use that as a starter. But of course, mm. you need worms and uh, uh, soil that contains bacteria. All right. And uh, how did I go about um, knowing about worms? I have been in this industry since I was six years old, when I used to stay in a village house. And my mother actually kind of opened my eyes to worms and intermittently over my lifetime, over these years, I have, um, whenever I stayed in a landed property, dabbled in it. Now, in the last uh, landed property where I was able to enjoy worms, um, I kind of found these worms at the back of a shaded area in my house and I said, good, I'm going to uh, grow them. And I did. So when I shifted to this current house about um, 12 years or so ago, um, I brought all these worms over from the old house to the new house. So I do realize uh, a lot of new homes, um, when you're given a new home and the garden, the garden is quite clayey, you may not have even one single worm to speak of. You may have to rely on friends to give it to you. Now, are there worms available in the market? Uh, yes, um, again, as I said, 15 years ago, I, I did look it up and I found that there were sellers in worms um, from New Zealand, they cost one, uh, one, one kilogram of worms, or was it one pound? I can't remember. Cost about 29 uh, New Zealand dollars. So uh, are those for fishing? Well, I don't really, because somebody I noticed somebody was asking what type of worms. If you ask me, I'm not a connoisseur there. I just know worms are worms, whether they are surface crawlers or deep crawlers, as long as they go into the pot, they stay in the pot because there are very few holes to escape. Some do escape, but most of the time, they stay in the pot and do the job they ought to be doing for the owners. So it doesn't matter. And when the MCO is over, EcoHub um, would like to get these worms from, from me. Um, I am rich enough to allow all these worms to go because the more I rare or rather, the more worms I have, the more worms I will be eager to spare. Because it just multiplies. As long as you feed them, every spade full when the soil is, when that, that, that pot is mature, comes with worms. In fact, I would describe them as like Medusa head of worms. Almost the same like the one that I shared with you. They just crawl all over. Now, what about to those people who are weak-hearted and do not like the look of worms wriggling around, just wear dark sunglasses, I believe, and <laughs> dig into the soil. I have some questions regarding the uh, so-called pests that come, like black soldier fly or black ants in container. This is from Michael mm -hmm. Lee. I I'll just go through a few questions first, so we all go through at one point. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a sometimes issues with the custard fruits, or the apple custard fruits, like white mm -hmm. patches. And Rennie Kyung asked about getting rid of ants in a composting bin as a result of the fruit peel thrown in. Okay. These, these are, so I think, I, normal yeah. issues. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'll go one by one. About those white flies, um, the white flies in the custard apple is actually the measly bugs. So what I would normally do is, you know, your toothbrush, not a used one, but a clean toothbrush from the hotels would serve the purpose. Go get a toothbrush and then go brush the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the fruit and all the flies, the misty flies will drop off. Similarly, after you pluck the fly, uh, pluck the fruit when it's ripe, do that under the tap and you will find, please don't wash it into the compost again, but wash it into the drain and then uh, you will have a fruit that's free of the misty bugs. Now, as for ants, yes, they are quite a menace as well. But, um, and, and sometimes what is worse is they lay their eggs together as a part of, a, you know, um, ant uh, collection, you know, with, with, their, with their ant, uh, we call them eggs or whatever. When I do see that, what I do is I put it in a pot and sun dry it until all the eggs die so that, you know, I can reuse the soil again. Sometimes right. you actually see that in your pots as well. You know, if let's say I plant vegetable and then when I notice that the vegetable is not as healthy as it should be, 
when I emptied that pot, I realized, aha, uh -huh, they are infested because, or rather the pot is not healthy because the roots have been attacked by these ants together with their collection of baby ants. And so the whole pot gets uh, out and the soil goes for sunbathing. Perhaps anyone would like to ask a question directly? Ramesh, you can check. Um, maybe I should raise a point as well. Okay. Now, those of us who are not careful, especially in the Malaysian warm climate, will get um, like maggots. Maggots, right? Don't panic. It is not unusual if you're not careful uh, because you have not covered it properly. You've not covered your, your fruit peels or whatever carefully. So flies do settle in, maggots do appear. All you need to do is to add more layers. After all, in China, in order to accelerate the um, composting process, they do it in a very uh, careful, graded manner. They use maggots because maggots are more voracious eaters than earthworms. So it is acceptable to do that, to have maggots, but don't allow it to um, be the main... Um, composter. Earthworms should be the one because you know when you have earthworms going through it, what they pass out as cast gives you a very pleasant earthy smell. You know, uh, you, you will know it when you have actually experienced it. I'll just read some of the comments also being made. Um, just one minute. I think uh, I have a question from Australia. Dr. Stephen Gatt is uh, very keen to ask a question. Sure, go ahead. He has been actually a, a, an avid uh, worm grover as well. He has got 14 years, he tells me. <laughs> uh, thank you, YK. Once again, I, I learned quite a lot from you, as I always do. Uh, it's very interesting, I find, that over here we do things very differently. I have two worm farms, as we call them. They're nothing special. They're like, you know, uh, uh, like a pagoda, basically, structure with three layers. The bottom layer is empty and it contains the water, what you call the tea from the, from the worms. The next layer is the castings of the worms. The worms will always grow up to the top layer. So basically once you've got the castings, you take them all out and you then put them all over your garden. We don't use any, in, in, the, in the worm farm, I use no soil at all. So basically what sits in there is the scraps from your, from, but you have to be very careful. For example, uh, I wouldn't put in watermelon, for example, uh, which is hard and fibrous and gives you nothing at the end of it. But nevertheless, I would remove uh, bits from watermelon. Again, I never put allium, any of the allium plants, um, onions, shallots, um, uh, leeks and so on, never go into the worm farm. It kills the worms, I find. Uh, and also citrus, you said, uh, it might sound all right to put them in a pot, but certainly you don't want to put them in a worm farm. They are highly acid and it does kill the worms. We buy the worms, as you said, in bags in New Zealand and Australia, in bags of half a kilo or one kilo. And I get there's about 10,000 worms in most of those bags we buy every now and then, but you don't have to buy them very often, probably once every 10 years or so, if, if the numbers are going down. But what this thing produces is fantastic. First of all, it's covered. So effectively, there's no maggots and there's no flies and there's, it doesn't generate any smells at all. You can put them away from the house so you don't get the ants and so on. Uh, the second thing that I find fascinating with them is that uh, they, they consume vast amounts of, of, uh, of plant material mainly because it's all full of water. So that most of what you put into that worm farm ends up either as water, which you can then use to as fertilizer for your plants, but also the food is, is, is very good. The other thing I find that is very useful is they like to stay in a, warm in, in a warm and wet environment. I guess in Kuala Lumpur, it's not gonna make much difference because it's a pretty humid uh, conditions, but what I do is I cut newspapers into the shape. What I've got a square one and I've got a round one. Um, and I just cut newspapers, wet them in water, and then put them on top of the worms as they sit eating their food. And all I have to do is lift up the, the newspaper, 
chuck in all my, my scraps and put it away. Uh, the rest of the scraps though, all other food, no, anything that has fish, meat and so on must never get into there. Anything with oil uh, damages the worms themselves. And um, what I find that is very useful too is that, uh, uh, is that uh, the scraps I think have to be soft things that they can eat and that decompose very quickly. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. The, the rest can go into the rest can go into the uh, recycling bins. Okay, I totally agree with you. There seems to be some difference between what you practice over your side, and that's because the temperatures are very much cooler. By the way, Dr. Stephen, at uh, Gat stays in Sydney, and uh, the, the the climate there, you probably only see flies in the summer months, where else we see flies here every day. So uh, there is a huge uh, climatic difference or weather difference and um, our environment uh, is probably very different. But um, with the way I do it, um, I am, as I said, able to even accommodate um, those uh, durians, uh, durian skin and uh, almost everything that um, I have shared with you goes right into the bin. I do use uh, fish as well, even um, fish water plus fish, um, you know, bits and pieces of fish that cannot be eaten goes right in, but of course I have to cover. If I don't, then obviously the vermins will get at it. So I have become more adventurous over the years. As I said, I played it by rule, no oil, no nothing, almost perfectly clean, I would say. But now nothing goes in except those things that I have, nothing goes uh, out of the compost bin. Everything that is organic goes right in. And uh, only those that I mentioned that can potentially infest the compost bin and infest the plants and then um, push my, my, my garden into um, nothingness. So I would uh, encourage every one of you to do it um, and learn over the years. I do see a lot of questions that has come yes. through, but I'm not very sure whether we can answer every one of them. But yes. uh, Mr. Ku has promised that he will collect everything, being the organizer. Uh, Mr. Ramesh and Mr. Ku feels that it can be collected, and I think there's a system of collection. Yes. I will faithfully um, go through them. And uh, those of you who have picked up the uh, Eco Hub address or my address, which I have shared. Um, earlier, you can kind of write to me if you feel your question has not been um, answered completely. Yes, I've noticed that some of the questions have probably been answered, but maybe not in depth. Uh, and as suggested by Dr. Chan, you may address it directly to her or you may post it to us through our chat group. You know, please join our chat group and uh, we'll try to get Dr. Chan to uh, answer to those queries. Yeah, I yep. think it's a good idea to join the chat group because you may think I'm learned, but I learn from everybody as well. And I always believe that I have only one brain. But when I see a collection of um, 100 people, we have an IQ of 100 times 100. That's yeah. a very, uh, that's a genius, right? Yeah, yeah. more than that's, a genius. So I believe if you put all these brains together, um, they will make a formidable force. They will answer every question that you have. See, we even sometimes ask Sikh to help us. And of course, the Sikh um, showed that they can be wrong as well. So there's never a right or wrong answer for everything that we seek the answers for. It is only a matter of time. We all learn by making mistakes and we all learn when everybody else share their information with us. Right. Great. So I think uh, if uh, it's okay, then we will just uh, make some comments and then we will conclude in the next two or three minutes. Yeah, because the questions are fairly interesting, but we'll try to take them, uh, you know, uh, we'll try to respond to them as mentioned earlier. Mr. Ku, you'd like to say something? I think you may have to be leaving soon. You want to say yeah. something else? No, it's okay. I'd like to thank Dr. Chan for this presentation and follow-up questions I think would be very interesting if you can send it to the chat group. Uh, Dr. Chan is there, and I think she will always find the time to respond to you, reply to you, no matter how difficult or easy the question is. So, please do that. 
Yes, and as mentioned by Dr. Chan, we have a few others who are quite uh, an expert in this area. If you feel they can also attempt to answer the questions. You know, we have uh, Mr. Ting, and I think we have one uh, in Chizuki, if I'm not mistaken, uh, who seems to be very, very well read. Uh, in this case, well practiced. You know, they, they actually, I mean, you can read about everything to do with agriculture. Uh, unless you practice it, then you will be able to preach, I think, in a better way. All right. So uh, do keep your questions coming. Do join our chat group. I, on behalf of STEM for All Makerspace, would like to thank, uh, thank Dr. Chan for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we have met a lot of new faces here, and uh, we would like to continue to engage with you. And hopefully, when this COVID uh, pandemic has uh, died down, then we can become more alive, you know, and we'd like to invite you, we'd like to invite Dr. Chan uh, and her CEO uh, as our guest to our STEM for All Maker Space. We'll have plenty of real hands-on activities. Okay, we can actually do the composting workshops and whatnot, you know, uh, beautiful sessions at our center with the support of Diamond Mall, right? Uh, Mr. Chan, uh, sorry, Mr. Ku has been talking to them uh, with regards to having a dedicated space for upcycling and recycling. So we look forward to be able to establish such a center in which every other members can actually join by giving, sharing their expertise or participating in the programs that will be organized soon. All right. So with that, um, Dr. Chan, is there anything else you would like to say before we uh, thank all our participants today. I would like to thank all of you, although you think that you have learned from me. In fact, I must tell you, I have learned more from every one of you than you have learned from me. I really enjoy all your comradeship, all the little, little things that you share with me. And when I put them together, they really amount to a lot of learning for me. Thank you so much. It's uh, indeed, uh, that's the tagline of our center. It's a continuous learning. Okay, learning is uh, from cradle to grave. So it's we learn every day. So I think that's very much what we practice at our STEM for All Maker Space. And uh, the other interesting aspect is it has to be hands on. You know, we, we have to get our hands involved and then we can see the excitement in developing new products, new projects, new activities. So with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, on behalf of STEM for All, we'd like to thank you for joining this session, and we look forward to your participation in future events, both online as well as offline. And one way is you can follow our Facebook link, which I will share here, or you can also join our EcoHub community group, right? So just give me a second while I share with you. Uh, our link to the Facebook. Uh, we've got a Facebook which talks about STEM education as well. So if you have got kids or nephews or grandkids who may be uh, interested, um, you can also get them to follow us on our Facebook. Uh, that's the link to our Facebook, all right? So thank you again. And uh, shall we say bye-bye? Right. Uh, we'll also be posting this video, this recorded session with the consent of Dr. Chan uh, on our YouTube channel. All right. So if Dr. Chan has got no objection, then we will post this on our YouTube channel. And those who have missed it can also follow us, can just log into our YouTube channel and follow the full session. I have no objection. Please record and disseminate. And can uh, Mr. Ramesh ask the organizer to take a picture of this uh, screenshot oh, yes. or something? Great. So that, uh, yeah, yes. we know. Can all of you please put your uh, best smile, put yourself on? Yeah, turn your cameras on. So your... that uh, you will be visible, so that I know all my friends or would be friends here. All Oops. right. Uh, no, I think uh, we've all, uh, are, are we all right? Yes, somebody has to uh, press the share screen. Can can her name is Savitri, is it? Okay. Ah, right. we are we are better now. Yes, correct. Uh, Mr. Jack, can you help us with the group photo? Oops. Uh, hey, you I hold think... on, huh? 
Okay. Wait, 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 wait. I, I, I think I've lost, I've lost my screen. Can you hang on for a while? I don't know whether my <laughs> smile is good enough. Maybe we should uh, wait for a while. Oh, dear. Where is it? We can see you. Ah, yeah. Okay, I shall put on my best smile. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, William, Miranda, can you come on also? Are we going to have action as well as one of our pictures? <laughs> smile first and then action. Okay, thank you. Action, action. Okay. Thank you. Right, uh, I have to take, uh, let me see, I have to take three photos. Huh? Okay. Uh, because there are multiple screens involved here. Sydney, can you please put your video on? Sydney is my cousin. I don't know why. Pictures <laughs> not there. Yeah, um, please. Uh, please put your pictures on. Yeah, please on all your cameras. Yeah, oh. we want all the beautiful, happy people here. People who are relaxed, far from the meddling crowd. Are we there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me take a photo. Not everyone have on the camera, but I will just take the photo first. Uh. Yeah. Okay, right. uh, those who have not turned on, can you please turn on your cameras? All right, are you ready? Yes. Yep. One, two, three. All right, second one. One with action. Oh, right. oh, 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 I'm going to take a second page first. <laughs> yeah, because there are, there, are, there are so many of you. Okay. okay, one more time. After we do the hard sign, wait just one minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, please smile. One, two, three. All right, I've done two page, both the pages. Okay, one with a heart, one with a heart. All love, right. Love. How do you do the heart? Okay. Now, let me see. All right, Cindy, you're very good. The heart. How to put the heart? Where to put the heart? Oh dear me. How? Oh, oh, up there. Up there. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. Love la, put love la. Yeah la, love la, heart, love, whatever you call it. Okay. Ready? One, two, three. Okay. Right. Do you want to take one more on a freestyle? Yeah. <laughs> Steve, where is Alice? Get Alice onto the picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let me get ready. Where's my CEO? He's not around. <laughs> All right, okay. Around. One, two, three. Okay. All right, take kind the of photo also. Thank Great. you. Thank you for this man behind the seat. You've been wonderful Jack, as well. Thank you, well. Jack. Her. Thank you, welcome, Jack. Welcome. No. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank I, you. Hope, I hope you have got one hour of very relaxed moment very, from the crowd. Yes. Thank you. Bye. 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 I had a good time. Very Great. relaxing. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, oh, it's William, William uh, uh, can you hear us? William Miranda, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Chan. William is in another webinar in front. Oh, okay. all right. Miranda, Miranda is our yeah, manager. Hi, uh, Dr. Outside. Chan. Hello, where is Miranda? Oh, Miranda, hi. And may I introduce you to Matron Lam here? Matron Lam uh, was a matron working with me once. Matron Lam, can you identify? Put your hands up. I see her. <laughs> oh, she seems to have disappeared. And uh, I saw Gali with the earthworm, Dr. Chan. <laughs> no need, no need. You saw me picking it up with the hands. Cannot Last time I used to pick up with the bare hands, but now I, I, I want to preserve my hands. Um, you know why? Because you know my hands are so abraded that it won't pass the immigration anymore. So I have to have a special letter that says my hands don't have the put, um with the fingerprint that will allow me to pass the immigration. So it's that bad. I have to try to recoup that now. 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, we had a good time. Yeah, but yeah, yeah at least it keeps the plants all very healthy. I know. We have to do it. Dr. Otherwise, Chan, can I ask? Yes. yeah, 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 Carol. Yeah, I know. Um, do you turn your soil? Do you need to turn it? Yes, yes. The more you turn, the better aeration, and um, they can. You know, these worms while they go searching for food, they're actually blind. I don't know what it is that um, allows them to move from one end to another. They just wriggle blindly and they get their food. They are blind. <clears throat> so they cannot see. And you have to turn them over to accelerate the process. So I do happily turn them whenever I have the time. There is a lot. Yeah. But if you do that, sometimes you cut them accidentally then... Don't worry, they always get replaced. <laughs> I have been told that if one part of the worm gets dissected, the other part will grow to replace yeah. the part. So don't have to worry about them. I don't think they feel much pain. Or even if they do feel the pain, they don't complain. You can't, you can't remedy the pain anyway because you don't know whether it is. Yes, Lily, I see you putting up your hands. If yeah. you have any questions. I want your phone number, the field. Oh, oh dear. Um, can I suggest you join the Eco Hub first so that I don't have to uh, give my phone in public and uh, we just reach out to the community from there? You've got the number for Eco Hub? Just to ask for you. No, 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 no. You, have, you must have got the advertisement, right? Uh, yeah, I think got. Yeah, if you look at the advertisement carefully, there's a number to contact Miranda with. And that's how you are going to be placed in the Eco Hub community. All the growers are there, and uh, my, my, my phone number would be there as well. For that. Okay, thank you, Chan. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. Thanks. The past are not here. In my past bye. Bye. Oh, bye. Bye. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Thanks. You're welcome. So welcome. Oh, Look forward bye. to seeing you at our center soon. No worries. I'll bring my bags of worms for you, Mr. Ramesh. <laughs> oh, please do. Please yeah. And we must no, don't work. worry, Miranda. <laughs> a lot of my um, a lot of my uh, fellow care providers. Okay. Ask me for words and I will happily <laughs> lock it What's over. Nice, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so my sea worm, I always say William, throw away, throw away. No, you don't throw worms away. They are very precious commodities. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs>